My name is Ottaviano Canuto, and I'm a senior fellow at the Policy Center for the New South. This is the third of a series of uh, short videos dealing with subjects covered in my recent book, Climbing a High Ladder, Development in the Global Economy. Today, the topic is global inequality. In the previous discussions, we dealt with uh, trade globalization and with China's economic growth and rebalancing. Is there a relationship between them? Global inequality is the relative inequality of incomes found among all people in the world, no matter where they live. So uh, it has two dimensions, between countries and within countries. So has globalization been a major driving force of inequality between or within countries? What about the weight of national policies and determinants? We will first display some evidence on global inequality, and then we try to say something about those questions. Let's start with the Lawrence curve. The Lawrence curve is a way to represent the, uh, the degrees of income concentration. Look, uh, you divide the, the, the population into uh, 100 percentiles, percentiles of income, right? And, uh, and you would display the shares, the cumulative shares of uh, the income uh, along those percentiles. And uh, if the, the income was so evenly distributed that everybody had the same per capita income, then the Lorentz curve would correspond to this diagonal, right? Whereas if uh, income was so concentrated that the 100 percentile had it all, then it would correspond to something like this. Now, uh, reality is in the middle. And uh, as you can see, the, the chart here uh, displays the, the Lawrence curves for uh, 1998 in blue and 2008 in red. And notes how uh, the curve uh, shifts here in this part uh, to closer to the diagonal even though there is an intersect uh, around here. So the Gini coefficient is the measure that's mostly used to refer to inequality. And it, has, it's, it, uh, it represents, it is the percentile, uh, the percentage of the, the, uh, the area between the Lorentz curve and the diagonal as a proportion of the, uh, the whole thing, which would be 100%. And indeed, this is what uh, the data uh, show about uh, the period uh, between 1988 and 2013. So uh, the higher the Gini coefficient, the, the more unequally is distributed the income. And there is a, a lot of variation among countries, uh, despite similar experiences with globalization and technology, which suggests that other factors are largely responsible for the change. And keeping in, 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 in memory how we saw uh, or I depicted the decline in poverty uh, during the globalization period uh, in the world. So the bottom half of the world's income distribution gained during the globalization. Now, looking at the left-hand side of the chart, you can see uh, a convergence in average incomes across countries spurred by rising incomes in populous countries like China and India, but also in other ones. So as a result, between country inequality declined. In contrast, within country inequality, the other component of global inequality took on a greater role in global inequality. It explains a third of the total variation. So the global trend towards increasing globalization since the 90s uh, seems to have two different distributional consequences. On the one hand, income inequality between countries has declined, while economic inequality within countries has increased. You can see on the right-hand side that the levels and trends in average inequality are quite different across regions, although uh, we, we, one can see uh, a broad-based decline more recently. 
Developing countries in general exhibit wider within country inequality relative to developed countries. Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as Sub-Saharan Africa, stand out as high inequality regions. Latin America and the Caribbean has succeeded in reducing inequality recently, but from very high levels. Sub-Saharan Africa has likewise narrowed inequality since the early 90s, but this progress hides wide ranging variations within the continent. Eastern Europe and Central Asia, average inequality rose sharply after the fall of the Berlin Wall, but has since been on a declining trend. The average industrialized country saw an increase in the Gini index from 30 to 33 between 1988 and 2008. In the five years leading up to 2013, average within income inequality appears to have fallen in all regions except in the Middle East and North Africa and in South Asia. Uh, notes that average inequality within countries was stagnant or even falling over much of the period of 1820 to 1990, most notably over the middle half of the 20th century. Not by chance, uh, uh, a period known as the great leveling in the rich world or golden decades, if we take into account the growth uh, in, in, in the all rich countries. This pattern changed dramatically toward the end of the 20th century with an overall pattern of falling inequality between countries alongside rising average inequality within countries that we can see in the left side. Let me uh, say a bit about a, a, a curve that became very much famous uh, in, the, uh, in, in the last decade, which is the elephant curve. Uh, the elephant curve was uh, created by two former World Bank colleagues, Christoph Lackner and Branko Milanovic in a working paper released in 2013 and became uh, one of the most talked about chart in international economics since then. The, the, the graph shows income gains at each point of the global income distribution, the 100% percentile, okay? for the 20 years spanning the fall of the Berlin Wall to the 2008 financial crisis. This curve has been revisited, the figures uh, have changed, but, uh, but the idea is to take the world population, line it up in percentiles from poorest to richest, and then match the income growth each percentile achieved from 1988 to 2008. Uh, China and India, uh, with their rapid growth, constitutes the bulk of the elephant, driving down global inequality, while the global richest 1% lift the elephant's trunk. And in between, there would be the supposed losers from globalization uh, in this version of the chart, seeing zero income growth. Uh, and this is a feature that is very often cited by people as part of the explanation of the advent of uh, Mr. Trump in the US and of Brexit in, in the UK. Uh, while the, uh, the elephant's hump-shaped back reflects the fact that over 500 million people were brought out of poverty, measuring poverty as someone living on less than $1.25 per day. And, uh, but also, uh, the tip of the elephant's trunk at the far right shows that the world's super rich, mostly from advanced countries, are much richer than in the past. The tail at the far left shows that the world's poorest, mostly from Africa and South Asia, would be only slightly better off than in the past. And uh, the dip around the base of the trunk is perceived as showing that incomes of the lower and middle classes in industrial countries have stagnated or or grow very much less. And taken together, uh, many people uh, interpret the, the, the figure as showing that globalization helps poor countries to grow at the expense of the lower and middle classes of rich countries. But this line of reasoning has flaws. Why? Well, the evidence suggests 
to begin with, that most people in wealth countries did well over the period analyzed. In addition, several fundamental changes other than international economic integration were big factors uh, in income growth over time. And uh, there are many alternative explanations for the shape of the elephant curve. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, the fall of the Soviet Union and the economic stagnation of Japan uh, caused income in those countries, in those areas to decline or stagnate. In the case of Japan, driven by its rapidly aging population uh, and, and so on. Uh, so the shape of the curve uh, changed dramatically when, once one takes out, uh, for instance, uh, Japan and the, the former Soviet Union. My, uh, Caroline Fround uh, at the, uh, from the World Bank today uh, did that exercise. But also, look, another important factor, the increase in automated production changed the landscape for manufacturing around the world with uh, fewer workers needed. Uh, and this, this trend is, is something that we mentioned uh, in the first video and it tends to be exacerbated in the future. There were also policy shifts in some advanced countries with implications uh, regarding inequality. Think of the tax cuts and the deregulation carried out by President Ronald Reagan in the United States and British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. And also, it's hard to imagine that international trade could be the primary cause uh, for uh, the, such a large drop because trade is not a zero sum game. Countries import goods that are relatively more expensive to produce. So greater imports raise living standards because price fall. Countries export goods that they are more efficient at producing so greater exports and enhance productivity, which further raise incomes. So while it is true that people employed in import competing sectors lose from globalization in relative terms, uh, economic research suggests that the vast majority of the workforce gains from increased trade. And a final remark about the, the elephant curve, the image does not show how the 80th percentile from 1988 fared over time, rather, it compares the 80th percentile in 1988 to the 80th percentile in 2008. So zero growth does not imply that the incomes of the 80th percentile in 1988 did not grow. The original chart compares the people in this bracket in 1988 with people in the same bracket 20 years later, but they may not be the same people. They may not belong to the same class. They may not even belong to the same country. Now. But anyway, one interesting aspect to take into account is the following. Oh, uh, most analysis on, on, on income distribution, they are based on household surveys. And one problem is that the rich are less likely to participate in household surveys. And there is an underreporting of incomes, especially income from capital. Well, then some, uh, uh, some, uh, a group of uh, people from Berkeley and uh, from the Paris School of Economics uh, decided to, to complement the, the household surveys with uh, a, a finer estimate of uh, the income on the upper brackets of uh, the, the income pyramid. And uh, by combining exactly uh, the, the, uh, the household survey source, the existing ones, with their own research on top incomes, whatever they were able to do it, they found uh, a somewhat different picture, uh, which is the one, for instance, uh, here in this chart. I, I took some, some of their charts uh, to our discussion here. Notes the breakdown that they make at the top of the distribution. The top 1% group is divided into 10 groups. The richest of those groups is also divided into 10 groups. And the very top group is again divided into 10 groups of equal population size. The vertical axis shows the total income growth for an average individual in each group between 1980 and 2016. 
And so they obtain a more fine-grained analysis of the top of, of the income distribution. For the poorest 10% among the world's richest 1%, income growth was 74% between 1980 and 2016. The top 1% captured 27% of total growth over this period. And let's look at uh, their, uh, their results uh, with respect to the top 10% income shares across the world in, in the period. Uh, and they ask whether world inequality is moving towards the high inequality frontier. Well, note that uh, indeed, income inequality has increased in, more, in, in nearly all countries, but at different speeds. Again, suggesting that institutions and policies matter in shaping inequality. Since 1980, uh, by this indicator, income inequality has increased uh, in North America, China, India, and Russia. And it has grown only moderately in Europe. And there are exceptions to the general pattern. In the Middle East, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Brazil, income inequality has remained relatively stable at extremely high levels. So these regions set the world inequality frontier. Uh, again, notes, interestingly, the divergence in inequality levels uh, between Western Europe and the United States, which had similar levels of inequality in 1980, but today are in radically different situations. While the top 1% income share was close to 10% in both regions in 1980, it rose only slightly to 12% in 2016 in Western Europe, while it shot up to 20% in the United States. Meanwhile, in the United States, the bottom 50% income share decreased from more than 20% in 1980 to 13% in 2016. And those differences between Western Europe and the United States uh, have all to do with the different tax systems, uh, more progressive in Western Europe and in education, education of, uh, uh, of the population and reskilling. Uh, it's interesting as well to give a look at the uh, 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 income inequality from a broader uh, historical perspective. And uh, so clearly we saw the end of the post-war egalitarian regime, right? With the rise in inequality since the 1980. Now, uh, how to understand, how to explain the uh, Gini coefficient changes? Uh, a very important work uh, was presented at the IMF World Economic Outlook, uh, released in October uh, 2017, right? Uh, where the, the an empirical exercise of uh, 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 discriminating the sources of change in the Gini coefficient were presented. And look, look at, at, at that. The desequalizing effect of globalization was larger in advanced economies, in part because of outward foreign direct investment. While in developing countries, and especially in developing Asia, technological change was the main contributor to the rising inequality. But uh, look at that. Technological progress has made the biggest contribution to rising income inequality over the two decades covered. Globalization has had a much smaller desequalizing impact overall, reflecting the offsetting positive impact of trade globalization in the negative impact from the FDI, the foreign direct investment. The foreign direct investment as on average had a desequalizing impact on the distribution of income over the sample period, uh, as higher FDI inflows have increased the demand for skilled labor whereas outward FDI in advanced economies has reduced the demand for relatively lower skilled workers in this country. Notes as well, uh, the moderately negative effect of financial deepening on income distribution, uh, whereas greater access to education and uh, the shift in employment from agriculture to industry and service have supported improved the distribution of income. So, uh, Contrary to popular concerns, trade globalization is not found to have a predominant 
negative impact on income distribution in either developing or advanced economies. And of course, the appropriate policy response uh, is not to suppress trade or FDI or technological change, but to make increased access to education a priority. Uh, and the final point about the financial deepening, uh, well, it increased growth, but it appears to have a disequalizing impact because of the unequal access to finance between the rich and poor segments of the population. Now, another important uh, country-specific dimension of uh, what we're talking about is the, the weight of, uh, public, uh, of public social protection. And, uh, and they vary uh, a lot in the, in the world. Uh, this is, uh, the chart shows the public social protection expenditure as a percentage of GDP, right, in 2010. Notes the difference between uh, North America, particularly the US and, and Western Europe. This, this is very noticeable. And by the way, the income inequality in Brazil would be even worse were not for the social protection expenditure. Now, uh, let me highlight the, the, the following. Uh, of course, the, the public social spending matters because it can mitigate the impact of economic globalization on inequality. And it's true that the, the, the findings, the, the descriptive findings that one can find in the, in the literature suggest that among countries with high social protection expenditure, the more globalized countries display lower levels of inequality. Uh, once I, 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 I heard uh, Professor Richard Baldwin from the Geneva Institute uh, calling attention to the fact that Japan and Scandinavian countries had uh, lower degrees of pushback against globalization as compared to the US and, U and the UK. And definitely the strength of their social protection networks because of Japan and Scandinavians may have a lot to do with that. So let me propose uh, some takeaways from, from this presentation. Uh, well, the global trend towards increasing globalization since the 90s seems to have two different distributional consequences. On the one hand, income inequality between countries has declined, while on the other, economic inequality within countries has increased. Technological progress has made the biggest contribution to rising income inequality over the two decades. Globalization has had a much smaller disequalizing impact overall, reflecting, as we said, the offsetting positive impact of trade globalization and the negative impact from FDI. But first and foremost, domestic policies, both fiscal policies and social protection are the place where inequality is to be tackled. So uh, when one thinks of uh, globalization's effects on incomes, this has to be considered in, in tandem with the country specific analysis and policies. Please avoid simplistic generalizations about the trade and income distribution. A task for another day will be to examine the feedback loops between inequality and economic growth. Okay. Uh, you will be able to find a full discussion on globalization and its impact in part two of my book that you can find on those places on uh, set, uh, listed on the slide. The next video of this series will approach what it takes for a developing country to not miss the learning opportunities of using the knowledge spillovers that accompany globalization. Stay tuned.